Module 6, Introduction, Naming Compounds. Because there are over 30 million compounds known, a systematic method for naming them must be used. Different kinds of compounds are named by different rules. We'll explore a few of those rules in this module. We'll begin first with binary ionic compounds. As the name implies, these will be compounds that consist of two elements, one cation and one anion. A common example would be sodium chloride. And here, to name the compound, I simply name the ions involved. The cations tend to be metals, and in naming the compound, I simply name that metal, sodium. Anion names consist of a stem specific to the given element, and then an eyed suffix. So the stem for chlorine, is chlor, and I add the eyed suffix. You should be able to go both ways, go from the formula to the name, but also from the name to the formula. So for example, we should be able to come up with the formula for magnesium bromide. Okay, magnesium on the periodic table is a group 2A alkaline earth metal. When it exists as an ion, it tends to carry a plus 2 charge. So magnesium here would be a plus 2 cation. Bromine is a halogen in group 7A. As an anion, it will tend to have a minus 1 charge. And compounds must be net neutral, as much positive character as there is negative. To make a net neutral compound from these component parts, I need twice as many bromide as I have magnesium. Therefore, the chemical formula is MgBr2. Let's look at another category here where the ions themselves may be made up of more than one element. Here a classic example is KNO3. Naming rules are still basically the same. I'm going to name the component ions. K is potassium. NO3 minus is the nitrate anion. Again, you should be able to go both ways. If we had a name like ammonium sulfate, we should be able to come up with the formula. Again, let's think about what these component ions are. Ammonium, NH4+, plus, sulfate, SO4-2-. To make a net neutral compound, I'll need twice as many ammonium as I have sulfate. Therefore, my chemical formula, NH4-2-SO4. Obviously, there are some things here you have to commit to memory. You need to know some of the common stems. You need to know names for some common metals. You need to know the names for some of these polyatomic ions. These tables will be provided as a part of this module, and you should commit to memory the information you see in these tables. Here you see some names for common ions. Here are some common polyatomic ions that you should know. Let's look at a few more categories. Ionic compounds containing metals that have multiple oxidation states. So here we're primarily talking about the transition elements. These elements can have more than one oxidation state as a cation, and the name needs to reflect the specific oxidation state within that compound. And within the name, to specify that state, I'll use Roman numerals. This would be a common example. Here I've got a compound, a binary ionic compound of lead and oxygen. But lead can have more than one oxidation state. Here I know the oxidation state for the lead, though, based on knowing that oxygen, being a group 6A element, as an anion, is going to be minus 2. If these exist in a 1 to 1 ratio, the lead here must have been plus 2. 
my name will reflect that and that I would write this is lead Roman numeral two oxide. No space between the D and that first parenthesis. Lead two oxide. Again, we should be able to go both ways. If we had a compound iron three chloride, I should be able to come up with a formula. Here the Roman numeral directly tells me the charge the ion carries. If that's iron 3, the iron has a plus 3 oxidation state. Chloride we have seen before, a monovalent anion. To make the net neutral compound here, I'll need three times the number of chloride ions as I have iron 3. My chemical formula is FeCl3. Sometimes we have ionic compounds that contain water. These compounds are called hydrates. And the water molecules are incorporated into the solid's crystalline structure. An example is MgSO4.7H2O. I name this in much the same way I've named ionic compounds before. This is magnesium sulfate, and then to incorporate into the name the fact that this was a hydrate, I use a Greek prefix representing seven for hepta, and then the word hydrate. The complete name for this compound is magnesium sulfate hepta for seven hydrate. Again, we should be able to go both ways. If we were given the name, copper 2 sulfate penta hydrate, we should be able to come up with a formula from that name. Copper is a transition element. We know here the copper is existing in the plus 2 oxidation state. Sulfur in sulfate. The sulfate anion has a minus two charge. These ions would exist in a one-to-one -one ratio. SCUSO4 dot penta representing five H2O. To name the hydrates, you'll need to commit to memory the names of these various Greek prefixes. So everything you see here should also be committed to memory. We'll use those same prefixes in naming binary molecular compounds. We'll split this into two categories based on whether or not that compound contains hydrogen or not. All right, so I'm going to here indicate within the name how many of each element are present using those prefixes. If there's just one of the first element, I don't use the mono prefix. I would simply call this carbon di, representing there are two oxygens, carbon dioxide. Again, we should be able to go both ways. So if we were told we had di phosphorus pentoxide, the prefixes directly tell me how many of each element are present. Diphosphorus, P2, O5. If the binary molecular compound contains hydrogen, the rules are a bit different, and I don't tend to use those prefixes. For example, if I had this particular compound, I simply call this hydrogen sulfide, not dihydrogen sulfide or dihydrogen monosulfide. So when the binary compound contains hydrogen, it's simply hydrogen and then the stem and ide suffix associated with that other non-metal. Notice here I indicated the state, the physical state associated with this compound. That's because these hydrogen-containing molecular compounds, when in aqueous solution, tend to behave as acids. 
and when they're in aqueous solution, we'll name them as an acid. In the gas state, however, I'm simply going to name it using this systematic series of rules, hydrogen sulfide. If I were given the name hydrogen chloride, I should again be able to come up with the chemical formula. Hydrogen, when combined with nonmetals like this, will always have a plus one oxidation state. Chlorine, being a halogen, has a minus one oxidation state. These would exist in a one-to-one -one ratio and would simply be HCl, gas. Okay, what would these look like had they been in aqueous solution? H2S aqueous, so the subtle difference is here, the physical state has changed. If I see this in aqueous solution, I'm gonna consider this hydrogen-containing compound to be an acid, and I will name it as an acid. Here you simply use hydro as a prefix, this is hydrosulfuric, so you have the hydro prefix and ic suffix, and then the name of that element that is not hydrogen in the compound, hydrosulfuric acid. Some of these we're likely very familiar with already, like hydrochloric acid. Here I know it's simply a binary acid. There's that hydro prefix. The ic suffix chlor we know is the stem associated with chlorine. This was simply HCl. Another category of acid for which there are some systematic naming rules are the oxoacids. So the oxoacids will consist of hydrogen, oxygen, and some other nonmetal. Here are a couple of examples. This is named nitric acid. If we were told we had perchloric acid, seeing this per, the ic suffix, I recognize this as an oxoacid name, and you should be able to come up with the chemical formula from that name. Perchloric acid, as it turns out, is HClO4. There are several rules associated with naming the oxoacids, and those will be explored in the next introductory video associated with Module 6.